right. Right now. All right. Frank, are you calling us to order? I think I, I think I can. Uh, did we want it? We'll, we'll take your, uh, we'll take your question after we call the order. Uh, is that all right? That's, that's right. You go ahead. I'm putting it in the chat. All right. Um, anyway, uh, meeting is called to order, and a funny thing happened on our last in-person meeting. Well, maybe it wasn't so funny two and a half years ago. We had a pandemic. Uh, so here we are in for live and in person. Back at the, and I apologize for misspelling the Bozeman Center there. I, I guess there's no E in it. So, uh, I, I was thinking of Bozeman, Montana. No E. Uh, no E. So, anyway, I uh, wanted to welcome those who attended in person. We actually, in order to get to a forum, we need now, there are um, actually also give a quick chair report as part of our call to order. And currently, I am here as acting chair because I was your vice chair. And uh, Mary, who was the official chair, has resigned her chair, chairship, chairmanship. Right? Uh, and therefore, I'm acting. And John is acting as vice chair. We expect to be appointed chair and vice chair at the uh, September board meeting, county board meeting. So, so in this, so just so it's clear our capacity that we didn't pull an Al Haig and say, I'm in charge. Uh, okay. <laughs> just try to provide the context for why I'm leading the meeting today. Um, anyhow, and I think it was announced that that was going to happen. Anyway, um, uh, re, as we started discussing before the meeting was called to order, we have, we have two vacancies now. Mary Cornell, who is, uh, uh, is uh, going to finish up her doctorate. And now, uh, late breaking news this week, uh, I guess it was this week, Mike Carlton has resigned. That gives us two vacancies. Uh, we had one applicant who is, I uh, want to introduce Laura Gross, who is here live and in person. She attended, I think, the June meeting yeah. attended, and uh, she has applied. and. John and I talked with her and we have recommended that she be appointed. So hopefully we'll see if that uh, happens, but we want to hope, welcome you here tonight for sure. And hopefully we'll be welcome you for the future. Um, just a couple of other uh, quick housekeeping matters. Um, website, Angela reports that uh, I think we're, it's getting cleaned up. It's still a work in progress. Our the, uh, tech commission website but uh, Angela Easterwood has been working to help get uh, things uh, ship shape there. And I think we're uh, making good progress on that. Is, uh, I don't know if there's anything more you want to add to that, Angela, if you hear this. Uh, no, I just got the current information on today as far as the meeting location and the time that it's not virtual. So I removed the link from the website so um, visitors couldn't view. Okay. Good. So I think does that, I think that means we're not being or there's not the opportunity for the public to live stream it. Not tonight, not tonight but hopefully once if we adopt our um, policy, then we'll be able to do that going forward in September. Right? Okay. So that's about it. But I'm working on adding the recordings, agenda, and uh, minutes from previous meetings. Okay. Very good. Th thank you, Angela. And then. Uh, just give you a fair warning now. The September meeting, well, for, for right now, it's going to be a physical in person meeting. We'll see if we adopt the policy whether then it can actually be hybrid. But the next meeting would be scheduled for uh, Wednesday, September 28th, and it will be held here at Suite 511C at the Bozeman B O Z M A N Center uh, at 2100 Clarendon Boulevard. Uh, and it will be at 7.30 p.m. So we're going back to our long time 7.30 p.m. Uh, start time for in-person meetings. And let's see, uh, Jackie has a question. What is the current relationship between the county and Arlington Independent Media? Actually, Barry, you may be able to give a better answer to that. I'll defer to you on that. Honestly, I do not know. Not know. Heard of it. Oh, you don't? Okay.
right i mean it still receives funding from the county that i think that's so basically it is a you know, contract uh, contractable for the time um it may be one of those things at some point we want to reach out to them to invite them to come up yes i think that was something that we might look to you to to do that because i think it is something we talked about and want to do. at one time i was on the board I right no you, so do you have any yeah. Uh, That's why I raised it. Is we haven't. The reason I raised the question is we haven't heard from them in a while, and I know that we it was a there was a real transition in terms of level of funding and so on, and so there were questions about how it was going to operate, and um, so I'm. It's been a while, and I thought we should get a maybe next time get a status update. Okay. My only affiliation with AIM right now is this as a member. Yeah. Okay, very good. And there has been a significant change in personnel, so I do not know personally. Can't I can't uh, really hear you? I can't hear can't you. you. Oh. Can't hear you. Oh. oh, so maybe we just have one. Okay. Uh, okay. All right. So there's been a change, but real yes, we'll look for a future meeting to try to get an update on status. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We want to scrunch a little better. All right. Do you have any public comments? Is there any? Actually, we have some uh, members of the. I think members of the public. No. Are are there in the waiting? Well, no. Louise and Kevin are both. Claudia is. I think is Claudia. But if Claudia this is, is a county tech. If this is right, a, that's what I thought. If this isn't a hybrid meeting, are we allowed to accept comment from the public out from the virtual? Um. I, I think real. I think real. Real accept. <laughs> I'm not a parliamentarian, but I would say as long as it's not official business, business right? I think you'll be okay. I think so. Yeah. That's okay. Any Louise, Kevin, any comment? Nope. Nothing from me. All right, good. Um, one of the and one of our agenda items for this evening is actually sort of plan out our the coming year, and I think. We may be getting to the point where we may want to get a um, regular report from both of you, possibly, if, or may, and also I think from Richard on BTS as far as where we are on the uh, uh, the renewal process. Okay. Uh, it, it may be just it's in the works, but uh, you know, but as we get closer, we know that we do have at least some role in that. So, uh, so we will. So that is something we may be putting on our calendar on a regular basis. All right, I think that um, any other public comment? I guess, Laura, you can comment. If you're no, I'm good. Thank you. That's good. That's probably a good, good plan for the time being. Uh, anyway, uh, that brings us to item number three, our electronic meeting policy, uh, which I did the best as I could to plug and chug. A uh, template was provided by, it's been passed on by the county attorney. So. It meets the requirements of the Virginia law, which takes effect September 1st. Uh, I'm not sure that there's any reason to debate it, uh, but I will entertain motions to adopt, I think. Uh, I'll move that we adopt the electronic meeting policy that was distributed on the meeting invite. Second. We, have a, we have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed? Any, any abstentions? Okay. Any motion. opposed? Okay, it looks motion, like it carries. Motion carries. Motion carries. Six, Six zero. Okay, <laughs> let the record go. All right, we have. Okay, so this means that we're entering the brave new world of the Virginia law, and hopefully there will be a new and improved Virginia law at some point in the future. But right now, this is what we have to abide by <laughs> as far as uh, both uh, in person and. Um, in person and I guess we can do hybrid uh, and we can do all virtual uh, up to 20, 25% or two meetings or 25%, whichever is greater. And since we have 11 yeah. meetings, I think you round to the next hole. So I think that three. means we get three we for get the year. Three. We get three for the year. 
that may be. Uh, yes, Phil. Is there something concrete that we can do in collaboration with other commissions to challenge this law on behalf of Arlington? So that's agenda topic number four for tonight's meeting, which is the legislative priorities right. and recommendations. Um, I uh, pulled the legislative priorities from last year from both the board report on the initial package as to that was uh, the this first step is that um, the first official step is that the county staff makes a recommendation to the board on what the package should include and, and ask to advertise that package to the public. They officially advertise that package to the public and then on the next board, board meeting they adopt the package with whatever adjustments were made over the intervening months. Before that first recommendation, um, the staff work with the public and commissions to formulate and solicit what recommendations should be. Uh, I think we've discussed several ideas for legislative recommendations over the past years. Um, and so one of the recommendations last year, if you look in the board report, was on virtual meetings. Mm -hmm. So I think we would be well within our uh, our um, mission to make a further recommendation this year to um, adopt, to modify the law sure. to be more liberal. I was thinking there's, there's strength in numbers. Yes. The informal communication that could take place that I could, think uh, develop consensus on some actual words. Yeah, so I think I think it sounds like many commissions are going to make the same recommendation. So I would be shocked if if it doesn't go up. Uh, so I I think if you want to liaise or someone wants to liaise with other commissions to unify on a set of language, that might be valuable. But if we write our own words and everyone writes their own words and submits it to staff, then I think staff will likely um, make that recommendation. Very good. Um, and uh, and real reach out to our board liaison to see if they're you know, a what the thinking is on the board at this point if you can share that with us and as well as uh, if he hears what, what he's hearing from other other commissions as well so we're trying to see what we can find out on that so the firm policy now up to 25 percent means what means we could be hybrid meaning you could be in person too and go hybrid one for every for the rest of the year uh, Basically, every third, every third meeting, every fourth. Yeah, it says not to do it consecutively, right? Fully virtual. There's a lot of nuances. There's a lot of nuances, and then there's the difference between the commission's meetings and then individuals' participations. There's a couple. There's like three different scenarios under which you can, as a commissioner, participate virtually. One of them is for personal reasons, and you've got up to. 25 percent the same the so same as two or <laughs> two, uh, two or right. 25 for your for, for your personal issues then there's another one for medical reasons which i don't think 25%. i don't think that has a limit on it the way i read it that's the way i read it too uh, um and uh, but you have to bring a note in from your doctor right. so my question um i have my hand up for a while my question is exactly that um what are the criteria is there a form and how do I apply for a medical condition? Because I do not expect to be able to attend in person for a while um, uh, due to, in, I mean, I'll be open. I may have multiple things, but the reason why I'm not coming is because I'm not meeting in small rooms. Um, I'm still very seriously avoiding COVID. So I don't go to group meetings. I, I have gone out, I, you know, eat outside sometimes, but in general, like I didn't go to the fair and I'm not going to, you know, I don't go to any of these group, any group things. So, um, and I, ha I can, you know, I could get documentation as to why I have conditions that make that advisable, but how much, what do I have to do and who, to whom do I have to send it and what do I have to to disclose about my medical conditions to get this approved. So I I haven't seen any supplementary guidance from either the county attorney or uh, in the law. I haven't really been looking that hard, but I take it to read it on its face, 
which uh, basically says that. Uh, let's so see. I'll, I'll give you the staff guidance right. on this, just to hopefully make it a little easier. If you agree as the chair that she has a medical exemption, right? That's all I needed. And it just needs to be reflected in the minutes. In the minutes, Jackie Snelling, both participation due to medical. Medical, health, right. And to look at where she is. Right, right. You do home. need to provide your location as um, well, Jackie. So if you document that in the minutes, minute, I don't need to know why. It's none of our business. Right. What the medical right. issue is. We trust each other that there's a medical reason. We document. Right. Just be prepared as this evolves, the county attorney may give us different guidance. Right. But at this moment, it, it is follow these rules as closely as you can. So and I read it the same. So way. I don't have any, I don't have anything in writing from a doctor. I mean, I've discussed it with my doctor, and it does change over time. And yeah. my doctor said this is reasonable practice under the yeah. circumstances. Right. And I think as long as you and Frank right. agree that it's reasonable right. practice, we will. So all I need to do is work. send Frank send Frank a note saying until. Further notice, I will be participating remotely from my home and the address due to medical conditions. That's yes, all. Right. Yes, I think that would should be. I think that should be sufficient. I think so. Yeah, yeah, as opposed to doing it for each meeting, it seems to me that um, as long as it gets into the minutes for each meeting, right? I think you're okay. I think so. Okay, so I, let's go with the blanket uh, for starters. You know, and then we'll, if we get additional guidance from the county, then we'll change. But in the meantime, that's what we'll do. If someone yes, has a medical ma exemption, right, like Jackie? They'll have full participating rights in the meeting. Correct. That, yes. Right. So, and, but it's reasonable and logical that in this COVID -ed pandemic environment we're in, that anyone has a, a reasonable concern about coming and being in person. Correct. Like me. Yes. Right. So, I'll vote for <laughs> sitting out and going dialing in too. Right. Okay, but then, but uh, is that simple? Is it that I mean, am I but, missing something? But I think uh, is yeah, but I think do we still have to have a physical forum? I, I don't, I don't think so. That I do not have clear. Yeah, hmm. right. So, okay. I'll play it by ear, but I'm just yeah, saying, right. You know, yeah. uh, but generally speaking, it is not not our job or place to judge a medical exemption. Okay, right. Um, well, that is that's encouraging. You and your doctor, and we take people on the. It doesn't even have to be a doctor. It can be like you're know, concerned about the pandemic environment. Sure. Right? Right. On this day and age, a lot of people have very legitimate personal medical reasons or health related right. reasons why they still may have concern and group gatherings if they're totally legitimate. Right. You no, know, that too, but that's that's yeah. a level above the fact that I'm just concerned about the pandemic. Well, for the pandemic been <laughs> pretty well listed by the CDC <laughs> for people over a certain age with particular conditions, they still are recommending caution. Yeah. So I, the, the way that I read the policy, there's no difference in quorum or participation mm -hmm. if you are virtually participating under one of these right. circumstances. Okay. Cool. But Arlington County government has declared that but, the emergency is over. So so one of the one of the clauses in the in the law is that none of these limits apply to meetings held virtually under a state of emergency declared by the governor which there's a specific exemption in the open meeting law before the pandemic that said you don't have to meet in person under the state of emergency. Right. So that is a declaration that the governor has the authority to make under and the law. That was the trigger for this. End of the state of emergency at the Commonwealth level took us back to full-time in-person meetings. So this was their way to give some measure of virtual participation. While imperfect, it was a step towards I guess we're gonna play it by. <laughs> yes, I think just read yeah. read the read the policy. It's, yeah. it's you know, and I will be in touch for sure as I get guidance from county attorney. All or at least we will be talking about it in our legislative agenda as well. Find the hybrid meeting valuable from comments and from reasons perspective. Right. And, so. and that's been our experience. Yes, this it, it's every board, every commission I talk to is on about this, yeah. and for once the Commonwealth is not. So right. it's an unusual situation. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. <laughs> and that hopefully that will yeah. change. <laughs> I'm new to Virginia. So. That's okay. <laughs> um all right, so 
this okay so that's i guess so we want greater flexibility for all virtual meetings yeah and that will be part of our one of our legislative asks yes yeah, so i think i think the goal for the agenda item tonight on the legislative front was to identify what recommendations we'd like to make and who is going to be interested in drafting language for our uh, submission in September. So Phil, uh, do you want to draft the liberalizing, regard to liberalizing the virtual meetings? Virtual meetings. Sure. Um, and again, I, I pulled down the board report specifically to provide examples of what went forward last year. It's not like, you know, amend section, you know, chapter 32, section five, paragraph C to strike this and say that it's very general, plain English language. Like, here's a thing that we'd like to make better. Kind of stuff. All right. And I think one of the other items was the um, um, bed ramp. Yeah, state ramp. Uh, we had we had posed a question to staff. Richard, about um, the uh, looking at uh, shared accountability risk management programs like FedRAMP or StateRAMP, uh, and if the county had looked into it, and if not, or if so, were there any impediments to the county uh, <clears throat> joining such a program um, under the assumption that there are impediments and that there might be legislative action needed by the Commonwealth to either create some sort of program, join some sort of program, or enable yeah. municipalities to join some sort of program our understanding is we're allowed to buy into a vendor that supports those programs or right. that follows those programs um, it's a choice that we have to make on a case-by-case -case basis um, sometimes there's higher costs involved or a different level of service like gov cloud versus cloud right um, so it is a case-by-case -case decision but I, i'm not aware of an impediment that prevents us from doing that. Um, but there is no such program at the co that the Commonwealth not yet. supports. They are not state grant members yet. So okay. it's certainly worth pursuing like, hey, this is a good thing the Commonwealth should do. Okay. Um, and, uh, but, but whether it's an impediment kind of remains. Sure. We're allowed to contract for those. Right. Okay. Um, so really the absence of the program, we could advocate, um, for the creation of the program. This is kind of one of the things I was thinking about was the FedRAMP program at the federal level has really changed agencies' ability to adopt cloud services much more rapidly um, while doing what they need to be doing from a cybersecurity standpoint, but nothing really exists like that for municipalities who have even fewer resources. I thought that's what state ramp is. So state ramp is true trying to be that but it's a little bit nascent there's okay. really i think it's only it's run started by arizona and there seems to be last time i looked so maybe six months ago there's only maybe another one other program one other state that had joined yeah. so are they there is that the program <laughs> like okay. virginia is pretty advanced like i don't know that we want to advocate joining state ramps specifically right. but that the commonwealth look at either joining or creating a similar type program to support its municipalities um, cyber posture and cloud adoption um, i'd be happy to draft that up if other people are supportive of that as a recommendation uh, should we hey i guess uh, i'll entertain motion to uh, make that one of our recommendations make, I, I was thinking that we make the formal for, formal okay. motion in september, september right okay, right so now just, just kind just, of okay, discussing just workshop the okay sure uh, is any generally support this notion of uh, sort of creating a state ramp like you know, if, if legislation is needed to have Virginia basically make the recommendation that we get something along those lines. Yeah. Everybody in favor? Mm -hmm. All right. I don't think we need cool. to take a formal vote, okay. but you know, just I'll I'll draft that one. Along those lines too, the incubator that was the guy presented by Stafford. Yeah, uh, there's the equivalent that are with ATAR, Advanced Technology Academic Research Center. Uh, and, you know, there might be some lessons learned from ATAR that would be useful for this Stafford program. I don't know the synergy necessarily, but it's uh, And I 
I'm a member of ATAR, so oh. if you uh, can get all the info, ATAR can go pass that to the right people. Right. I'm surprised you didn't mention it. I mean, and I, I'm, right. kind of, I'm kind of digressing, but sure. I mean, is it, I, would that be sort of a, I guess maybe a separate? It is separate. Separate app. But, but they do talk about, you know, uh, zero trust and all these other right, know, right. systems that are useful. I was thinking something similar with the, um, the Clarion and Innovation Zone project where the county was able to partner with like the, uh, Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, which is a Commonwealth funded like cyber experts at the various different universities. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think if so, there's something that already exists, I think our recommendation to be continue to support it and expand it. Yeah. So hmm. do you want to draft something like that up for the for the Center for? Uh, I'd like to explore that a little more with you. Okay. Which I understand. Right, we can okay. talk about it now. Yeah, I think uh, <coughs> if you had a chance to look at the recommendations that from last year, they're like. Well, question. Yes. Are we under any state restriction right now that prevents us from doing what we might like to do with regard to Connect Arlington or any other municipal network that we can? Um, substantial. Yeah. yeah. Depends on who you ask. Right. So one of the top two or three that come to mind, and are they candidates for offering up as a legislative initiative priority? So Connect Arlington is allowed to serve a fairly small niche at the moment. We have our municipal buildings connected, we offer Wi-Fi to the community. We are not allowed to engage in any sort of you were, I thought you just had to terminate in the county. It's, and I may be speaking out of turn exactly on what the legal limit is, because I'm not the county chief. Um, but there are limits on what type of commercial. Oh, yes, that's different from that. And um, so we have evaluated, and I think even this group has talked about the wireless authority. Uh, yeah. Broadband authority. Broadband wireless. authority. Uh, a broadband authority that would allow. There are a lot I'm of sorry, things. could you speak up? Sorry, there, there are a lot of things that have been proposed over the years, but most of it is um, a, a lack of provision in, in the enabling acts for local to do many creative things. Um, so outside of that enabling act, we do have the Broadband Authority Act that would give us that, but that also is a heavy lift for the county. A lot of things are set up in building that on a people that um, so there's numerous things that have been proposed, um, but for the most part, they're all heavy lifts or not allowed in the past. Right. And Aren't there some communities in Virginia that already have much broader authority to operate a municipal no, network commercially? In, I in, think they have authority. They've, they've created a separate authority. Yeah. Right. They've created that broadband authority organization and takes over the management of that fiber optic and provides services. So we, we could do what they do if we had the broadband authority. Yes. Right. Okay. And there is an ongoing feasibility study yes. on that by the count by the county. There, it is currently being studied. I don't have a date when that will be done, um, but there will be a report on what the options are and how it would work. At at um, ETS level, is there is there sympathy for creating a broadband authority or um, can you there, say what there the has is? been? Yeah, there has been sympathy for doing it. Um, the, the question is the people. It, it's a, to create a broadband authority, you're hiring a lot of people. Um, it's a big reason. Um, you have to provide customer service to your end customer. Right? And maintaining that fiber system is a, yeah. is a heavy lift. Right. Heavy lift. And once what I think you can start the or authorize the authority without actually operating. Too, yeah, which there yeah. are a number of these sort of you know. So there's um, the legislative solution, and then there's the operations. Solution. Right, right. right. Yeah, so the yeah. county could create the authority, but then you have to like fund it and get people working. It, it's right. a big change. And how right. how you want it, what you want to do with it too. So that so that, I mean there is you know a lot the, involved. The the assessment of uh, ARL fiber, the main advocacy organization on this 
was that changing the law to allow municipalities to do this was a non-starter in the General Assembly because this other avenue existed. That basically, if you wanted to do this, you have this other avenue, so just mm -hmm. use that. Yes. So I don't think it's appropriate for the legislative Understood. package, but it's so it's sort of our plan well, to act on this. I wouldn't say it's inappropriate for your legislative mm -hmm. package, only because it comes up every year yeah. in every session. There is, an, um, there is a push to amend the Enabling Act for local government to make broadband like garbage and snow removal and water. Like it gets inserted into that part of the Enabling Act by some legislator, and then it gets cut out in right. the process. But it does come up in every session. And we were told that it would be, well, by the legislative liaison, that it would be, you know, you'd really need to build coalitions with other municipalities um, so but yeah so that we can I mean make it part of our recommendation again but obviously we have this uh, our we have staff conducting the study and they if I recall correctly they're and they internal study they're under five consultant there are some people yeah there are call, yeah two yeah. two different yeah. consultants yeah two more uh, I do not have them so for the, um, for the there's been a lot of written communication about it, but it's not in my notes. So for the priorities for the upcoming year, I think the results of that study and, and our advice to the board about what to do with it would be a hot topic. So we want to make sure we're prepared for that. Um, but when do we get that? We we when don't know yet. Seven? We don't know yet, Jackie. We don't know when. We it's don't have a date for when it's going to be delivered. We do not. I, I do not either. Um, so Kevin. Uh, I'll throw something on here for us to work generally supporting of the the Center for Information or the Innovative Technology, the CIT in Stafford and support for the uh, sure. Commonwealth Cyber Initiative and those types of resources being okay. maintained and available to municipalities. Yeah, but I'd, I'd have to flesh it out some more, but yeah, sure. Um, I didn't. I didn't under, even understand how the whole Clarendon initiative tied in with the. Well, the, uh, it was just my experience yeah, on it. You'd be out of your hands in the middle of it. Yeah. Seeing, <laughs> seeing the value of the resources that were coming from the, the Commonwealth Cyber Initiative, like I didn't even know the resources exist. Right. So that's great that, that it's out there and state it's Commonwealth funded. So. And there is a lot of federal money that's coming. <clears throat> expanding broadband and I think every every state has put in one that was quite a few different federal programs so, awesome oh. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm collecting one of my okay. Jonathan okay yeah I, I just want to be clear on something here uh, Frank are, we're not endorsing the idea of any asking the legislature. Uh, no, we're not endorsing any. Well, I mean, to offer the broadband that service. Are we? Got to cut in and out, John. Well, just the idea. Yeah, the, the idea. There's a there's a law in the books that says municipalities can't offer broadband service, and and that's something we're not taking on here, right? I mean, I, you know, if somebody compared broadband to water and other utilities that are basically a natural monopoly for the city. And unlike water, Arlington has a number of choices of broadband providers that are actually pretty darn good. I've got Fios. I mean, you know, a lot of parts, most of the city is one of the best served in the country, like Comcast or Verizon or other other providers. I mean, it's just not something that we're doing here in Arlington, of all places, of all the issues that we have. Um, when we're well served in this competition, doesn't seem like a good use of of taxpayer resources to me. So we're putting a leg, some sort of legislative agenda item. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah so, Rich, Richard was Jonathan. If I could clarify, Richard was pointing out that some people do make that legislative recommendation. So should we want to support that, we could. I think the sense in the room is that that's not needed due to the other avenue. Um, that would be at least be my position. Um, okay, great. 
Yeah, there, there may be some parts of the state where it makes sense, but Arlington isn't one of them. Yeah, thank, no, yeah, thank no, you, Jonathan. I think that's yeah, no disagreement in the room. Yeah. You didn't get to the one I thought was <laughs> going to be top of the list. Well, what is it, Jackie? Privacy. What What would we like to make a recommendation? I thought, well, I don't know what it is because I thought that was one of the things we wanted to be doing was looking at the privacy law and and having some consideration of if there are changes to it, what would we like to see as opposed to reacting to um, things that are likely to be introduced or may be introduced. So it's really um, a better understanding of where we fit with the current privacy law. And um, we certainly have made recommendations <clears throat> on privacy. So the question is, where do those fit with respect to any legislative initi initiative? And do any of those require any legislation to implement? I don't know the answer. I mean, I, I guess, you know, since Virginia is one of a handful of states that's already adopted a comprehensive data privacy law, uh, I'm not sure. And, and there's significant federal legislation, which may or at this point probably not get adopted this session. And we've got some of the federal agencies that are getting into the Federal Trade Commission, for example, is getting into the act as well. So I, I'm not, sh you know, I mean, I think we could take a look at, it. I'm just not aware of what we would advocate, I don't know what we would want to advocate at this Well, I guess part of it was a better understanding of what our, how our recommendations fit in the current legislation, which we really did not do a detailed analysis of previously, and whether or not any of our, I don't know the answer, but if there's anything that we're recommending that is not already in the legislation, then there is the question of whether it requires it. I mean, uh, there's, there's number one, are there things required there that we're not doing? But then the second one is, are there things we're recommending that might need permission in there? And I don't know the answer. So I for my, my read, Jackie, most of our privacy recommendations have been focused on Arlington County government. And yes. with, I think, I think we haven't explored the issue enough to know whether there's legislative impediments to uh, Arlington County taking action um, at the municipal level. And I think there's a lot of things that we've re recommended that almost certainly do not require any legislative action at the state oh, that's true all right i just thought it was one that we had previously said we wanted to discuss but maybe not um i mean if there's something there i'm i'm open for because i think privacy is going to remain I, a major topic i don't i didn't have one i i really thought it had come up in our previous discussions so maybe i'm in error on that well if you think of something in between here and our um at the Civic Federation, our legislative committee is looking at that law. Um, their perspective is a little bit different than ours because their perspective is um, a civil rights perspective. So they're looking at it from, from that point of view. And um, there are some things where, for example, it's required FOIAs to get information about things that might be, information that might be collected that might be considered private. And so one of the things that people are interested in is some way where you don't have to pay two or $300 to find out what your, you know, what privacy, what private information might be retained, for example. And so that's the kind of thing that they're looking at. Yeah, I think um, the, the law that Virginia passed was mostly focused on regulation of private data brokers. Yes. Um, from a civil rights perspective, I think one of our recommendations was uh, regulation of, better regulation of 
uh, an oversight of surveillance technology employed by the county government? Yes, what we're collecting and how long we keep it and who gets it and that kind of stuff. Um, but again, I think we're the county's fully empowered to do that without any additional state legislation. So. Rather than following the FOIA law. Okay, that's a possibility. Yes, they certainly can. They keep going back to the FOIA law. Um, is there any other legislative recommendations that we've had in the past that we want to renew? I think we had, I can't even remember to be honest with you. Anyone else recall anything? Um, yeah, I can't. We've not had great success. <laughs> Doesn't mean we go keep trying. That's, That's right. <laughs> um, yeah, I can't think of any that are um, right for resurrection. Okay. I mean, I think we, I think it, we'd be comfortable if people think of something between here and September, drafting it, sending it around, and bring it to the meeting for discussion and potential adoption. Sure. Yeah, I think we have time. I think we do have time to do that. So yeah. So if anybody comes up with any that they want to be considered further, yeah, circulate it to the body as a whole. Yeah. Right. All right, that covers off on our legislative Legislative, any, I guess, unless anybody has any right now that they want to. All right, well, yep. On to Tech Commission planning. Coming year. Uh, I think we had had some discussions on this, and you provided a, a roadmap. Uh, yeah, on a couple of topics that we had. We have some ever evergreen items, right. which is obviously legislative uh, recommendations are one, and that's we're coming upon that time. Budgets another that we uh, do, and that's coming later in the year, and then um, and then we have some topics that we discussed in the past and I think want to keep on our on our plate. So uh, privacy, for example, which we just talked about, digital equity, which gets into the uh, broadband authority, municipal broadband, open data, uh, and then also some of the issues relate smart city issues, which we've been covering over the years, and then as they now apply to uh, national land yeah, I think those are you know, some of the broad, broad topics. I think that uh, I think are, I think John and I have discussed are relevant for us to uh, discuss. We're open to any others. That we may there was a pilot a discussion on this. Pi there was a pilot on Columbia Pike bypass technology for access. Well, the, oh, the, uh, yeah. the CBRS, you're talking the yeah, wireless. Yeah, yeah. The, uh, um, they, we know, they were going to give us an update on that. Oh, Richard, he, he might be able to. <laughs> so, but I mean, we can put that on the agenda. Um, CBRS. So I, I think all the network stuff, right? So to Jonathan's point earlier, right? There's a lot of competing technologies. Ways to yeah. get broadband speed internet to wherever you're at, right? Right. Um, but this isn't the legislative agenda. This is just. Right, for our topics. Yeah, yeah that's what we're talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so I, to me, like the, the feasibility study, which I'm. Personally, I'm sympathetic to the idea that this might change things, but I also don't know enough about the details to really fully buy in. So all of the different like broadband stuff, like the, the CBRS stuff yeah. that you're talking about, I think we should tackle as a whole thing, right? In the and past, well, we had someone give us a speech about it. Came in. Yeah. Right, right. Was some, actually, that's my understanding. To that policy they were going to yeah. do, the effectiveness, cost, all that, right. and pitch it. <laughs> and we did this. We studied for nine months. Is what we got. Right, where we are. Yes, yeah, so yeah. yeah, we, we want to follow up. I, mean, I, just, that. I, I think we had big... discussed that we wanted to try to get in, and I know uh, Mary reached out to try to get an update on yeah. the whole JBJ, JBG AT&T smart city platform uh, for national land. Right. And um, so we did. So I think this sort of maybe fits in. Well, that's okay. a specific I, one, but I mean, I'm just want to know how smart city will apply in the, the whole basket. Right. Some some the smart city. But this is specific, something specific study. They were going to come yeah. march in. Right, right. Dog and pony show about. And I do work. know that actually, I believe JBG um, actually acquired CBRS Spectrum for the 
use in the national land. Oh, okay. So as part of that related. platform. So I didn't they, know they that related. Tied together. Yeah. Okay, okay. I didn't realize that. So, I mean, but that won't be uh, the CBRS that was used to provide broadband to the students in the Columbia Pike was the county was using that because there are some CBRS frequencies that are basically in, you know, in the public domain and there are those that you can get more protected rights where you basically and at auction require that right. okay. require the license rights right. so, uh, yeah yeah i think that would be great um update yeah, that's all i'm trying to say yeah, yeah it's yeah. not you know half part of one meeting you know, three minutes from right but i think they sort of they you know there's intersectionality well, like yeah, yeah, they that do all that yeah. yeah and uh, another thing i've been providing updates on fixed wireless access and how 5G is being used by Verizon and T-Mobile as basically still a relatively small share in, in the broadband service. I think I just saw a study you know, maybe around 3%, but it's one of the fastest growing. Right. Um, uh, and it is, you know, again, another competitor, you know, competitor. I think the speeds that you're able to achieve with 5G, um, you know, make it, you know, compet you know make right. it competitive for, uh, technologically. Yeah. Person. So, so anyway, so yeah, no, so I think that all, you know all ties into the you know, the digital equity. But we we're, were talking about the CBRS and yes. how, the, how it was used you know, in the Columbia Pike area. I think at one point we were going to. I think you were. Really there was a study done, and they gave us a great presentation yeah. saying they initiated the study and. It'd be like for nine months or a year, and, and they come back and give us an update on the okay. On the exactly. yeah. yeah. Send me a, is it still being is it still being used or I do not know. No, yeah. But if you send me if you add it to list of questions, I'll find out because I know okay. who did that. I know the person. Person, yeah. Okay. So I can find out. Thank you. Okay. Great. Yeah, I think especially like exploring all the various different networks that are available, tech, different technologies. And thinking about it holistically will help us make a better recommendation to the board on whatever the outcome of the municipal broadband feasibility study is, right? Okay. It, 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 does it tie into that? The municipal broadband feasibility study? Well, so there's are they looking do they no they're the they're, they're not. Oh, okay. My point is I think we as should. a commission. We need to take a broader view right. of what the policy should Pull be. all the pieces together. Right. right. Okay. Yeah. And, and there is a survey that's gone out, out right? The, was that sent by the county on, on the, broad, the broadband? Um, I'm not aware how that survey is being done. done. Yeah. I'm not sure if that's by the contractors or if that's. It could be by the contractors or by PPH. Yeah. yeah. I think it might be. I think, Outside my department. Yeah. Okay. All right. I'm going to take another. I think I received, you know. Okay. They, they, I think there was a broad distribution dissemination of that trying to encourage people to um, do it and to do it. I think so. I'll take a, I'll take a further look. I think I received some communications on that. So I'm just in my I think my role as a citizen, not as a, as a, a member of this uh, body. Um, I think one of the other issues related to digital equity, we had a concerns about. Uh, affordability and there's a number of federal programs which I've also been reporting on that have you know, tried to bridge that gap so uh, uh, so I guess you know, you know I think it sort of needs to all tie together there so um other other topics uh, you, then you reminded me Frank about the cable, cable franchise renewals obviously right That's, that needs to be on yeah on yes yeah, so I've got two additional suggestions. First is <coughs> comprehensive IT plan. And the second is cybersecurity. That's the digital planning element that we've added. No, not, not digital, Sorry. information technology. Sure, the comprehensive IT plan that we've asked to be added to the Element that we've asked to be added, suggested to be added to the conference. I don't care where we put it, but we don't have one and we really want to. Okay. And then cybersecurity. And cybersecurity. You want to expand on either of those? No. Okay. And I guess we, and the 
Arlington Independent Media, too. I guess we ought to put that in there. Jack well, that, that Jackie had to raise that. And then I think we may want to maybe talk about all the peg channels again as well, right? I think we, you know, we used to sort of have regular reports on that. And I know that you know, the county funds all, you know, all three of them. Uh, the peg channel, which peg channels are public educational and governmental channels. So we have Arlington Independent Media, which is public access. We have the Arlington County ATV, Arlington TV, which co provides coverage of the county meeting. And then the APS, the Arlington Public Schools, has its own channel. So those are the three uh, uh, so-called PEG channels. They've received funding uh, from basically I guess there's a communication in lieu of a franchise fee. Commonwealth of Virginia collects a communications tax that then provides money back to the county, and then a certain percentage of that goes to fund the peg channel. Right? That's, there is, I don't know exactly how much money comes in those. I don't right. see that level of detail, but you're right. The communications right. tax comes in, and then um, funding is provided to. Arlington Television, uh, or sorry, the government channels that are on the fourth floor here, the Ames, Arlington Media, <clears throat> and then schools is just funded through schools. Schools, yeah. They get their large grant from yeah. the property tax. I thought they were, I thought they also got some of the. They uh, they have access to peg right. capital. Peg cap, right, which is, which is only which right. Is separate there's a distinction between operating. Right. Right. So the operating comes from the schools, but yeah, they can get capital. Capital right, needs right. come from another pool, pool of money, right. uh, which you see on a cable bill as a per subscriber peg charge. charge right. Dollar, I think it's a dollar sixty-eight right now. Um, it might be a dollar thirty-eight, but per subscriber, per um, there's a per month per subscriber charge that comes to us as dedicated capital that we <coughs> preserve in capital. the camera uh, video switches but all right yeah no. yes folks you mentioned the schools in previous years county support of the schools with networking and other technology has been an open area for for dialogue and improvement is is that stable now and are all the issues kind of handled and nothing more to look at or don't have an answer for you because it's outside my team. Okay. I think when I talked to Jack about it, at least fairly recently, I think things, you know, the relationship's still pretty good and stable. And uh, the one thing we did have a liaison from APS, Matt Smith, we did. who you may recall. Of course. We just recently learned that Matt has retired from APS. <laughs> <Right. yes>, so, <laughs> uh, so I don't know if you can. Can we ask you to try to find out if there is a new APS or is that what we, I mean, or put, put, we should put that in writing? Too yeah, we can one. ask. Yeah, just okay. add a okay. list of questions. Okay. Um, and I can ask. All right. Um, I cannot demand. Right. <laughs> Schools is a different organization. Yes. Oh, yeah. I can certainly ask. All right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And also, I guess we'll ask you uh, to maybe try to set up introduction to the new CIO? Yes. We can add that to the agenda for next week. Okay. Yeah, I think that would be good. There is a new uh, chief information officer for the county. Nor Norrin? Is Norrin. Norrin. The second is N-O-R-R-O-N. The second O is pronounced more like an E. Norrin. Right. Last name is E. I think I sent that around the announcement. To you is, is Jack uh, to have a staff in his new role? I do not know. I know he's working with the county manager more closely. He's not working with EPS directly. Um, but I don't know the contours of his new All right. Um, anything else? That, that could cover the. You're busy here. Yeah, that's a lot. <laughs> All right. um, anyway, well, we'll try to, I think, um, 
John and I will try to make some uh, sense out of all of that to keep us uh, keep us entertained. Yeah. Um, be interested in the commissioner's feedback on priorities for these topics. I'll send yeah. out the notes yes. that I took. Um, get them lined up. Um, obviously, budget is a must do. We have to have an opinion on the budget. So upcoming milestones for that are uh, the county manager usually provides preliminary fiscal results and close out recommendations in October for the FY22 year, uh, which the county's fiscal year runs um, July through June. So that'll be the fiscal year close uh, June 30th of 2022. Uh, and then the board uh, makes final appropriation of that closeout funding uh, in November. Um, so, Richard, I think what we would want to know um, leading up to the October um, board meeting uh, is whether or not the manager intends to, to recommend any appropriations out of closeout funding that are germane to our, our purview. So we can have um. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on the whole broader category of budget, um, we sort of quickly looked at the CIP, but it, we're dealing with a 10 year CIP and there are some things there where what we're going to want to do is track implementation. And there's some other things that are were in the, you know, not immediate year, but um on the uh out years um that i think we should take a little more time to look at before they come up in the two-year review um so we have a little longer to look at the two-year review but i think since that's where most of the systems that we're interested in are being funded we need to spend a lot more time looking at that cip and and following up on what we've purchased with it yeah, when when do you think would be a good time to ask for a briefing? Um, well, it's recently approved, so we should be able to get a briefing, you know, anytime we want at this point. I mean, I'm getting briefings on other parts of the CIP, and some of them are public briefings on hot topics like storm stormwater, for example, are all starting the week of uh, September, first week of September. They're starting their public meetings on what the CIP is doing for those things. So I would think, you know, relatively soon. I mean, it may not fit on the September agenda, but I think we need to know relatively soon what is are the expenditures that we're doing that were approved by the CIP and the bond also, because that the bond is not, of course, passed yet. That's what's coming in in November. So better understanding of what it is we're going to be funding um, in our area through the CIP and the bond, I think would be good. I think everyone in the room agrees with me. Yeah. And, and I think actually, I, I can't remember whether it was Jack or I, I think I may be remembering this from Aaron um, and Dipsum, but um, there's also a, a change of direction in what we're spending in the CIP for technology um, versus purchasing things versus leasing and um, some of the strategies for that. And so I would hope that would be part of that presentation because there's a, a fairly, I think, important strategic change going going forward about how we're funding our um, upgrades and staying current um, with new systems. So that's we'll want to since we're doing it differently and funding it differently, we need to understand it to be. Um, to take to make our comments in the appropriate time frame. I think isn't that really part of the cloud transition? Yes. 
a lot of those, a lot, right. of, a lot of the CFP programs for IT were new this year. But even more than the cloud transition, because it also includes things that we used to purchase that we're now leasing. I mean, not just us, everybody. Um, and and what the relative costs of those things are. And then the other thing, I think, which we raised previously, but I don't know that we've ever gotten um, a position on is um, what we do when we don't have expertise in house, and how we do the whole analysis um, as the um, as the environment changes, how we determine and be a little more forward thinking about the types of expertise that we might want to be bringing in house versus contracting for, because that whole line of when you develop expertise through contracts and what that does to your flexibility is very important um, as we get more and more rapid changes in systems. You know, having in-house expertise to advise you is pretty important on some of these things. So it's really personnel, but it's personnel combined with what it is we're envisioning our strategy is for providing those services and how the services are changing. Did I say that right, Richard? You did. <laughs> All right. Any other comments on timing for budget briefings and topics that we want to get on the agenda? I would love to hear always from economic development. It's been quite a while. Right, and I think that really does relate to the whole national. I think they were in, instrumental in the, the national landing dark fiber deal. So I, I think so. that, yeah, so maybe that's, I know we're um, looking to maybe get somebody from JBG to talk about it, but maybe we can also get somebody from economic development. Um, you may wait just a touch on AED. Okay. Um, they're going through a leadership change. Right. They have oh. not announced the next director at the head. Oh, okay. I don't know if they've identified the person. Um, so it may be some time before the next person is uh, installed in that position. We'll have an opinion. Okay. At the moment, we have an opinion. All right. Good. No, thanks. A little bit later in the year for that. Yeah. All right, we have any any other input on priorities or timing? All right, I think we can uh, move on to legislative update. Oh, you still get to hear it from me on that. Here's Frank, yes, okay. Ah, let's see. I started writing these down a couple months ago, so. I Refresh uh, All right. So the F FCC and the Institute of Museum and Library Services has signed a memorandum of understanding to jointly promote public awareness of federal funding opportunities, for, uh, broadband and the availability of affordable broadband programs in light of the significant role library pro uh, libraries play in promoting digital access and inclusion. So, uh, so I don't know if our, where our library our, I'm sure the libraries may be aware of that, but the, they're, they're being uh, asked to uh, help promote uh, these affordability programs, among others. Um, the FCC has ordered phone companies to stop carrying traffic regarding a known robocall scam, scam marketing uh, auto warranty. So those auto warranties, uh, they've actually asked the phone companies to uh, stop carrying those, those calls. Um, FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel has launched an investigation into the data privacy practice, practices of 15 top mobile carriers, uh, data retention, and data privacy policies. So that would include uh, AT&T, Verizon, and in fact, uh, Comcast with its uh, MVNO wireless services is included, and T-Mobile are those who were asked uh, uh, and um, so they're asking about their data um, uh, 
uh, uh, data privacy policies. And among the data the FCC wants, uh, re uh, 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 ge geolocation data, uh, uh, how long it's retained, how long uh, uh, if subs cannot, you know, uh, data deletion, how, how the uh, geolocation data is safeguarded, and um, uh, whether subs are notified when their geolocation mm -hmm. data is shared. So, so the FCC is uh, getting uh, digging into a lot of data privacy issues with the uh, cellular companies, the mobile carriers. A forthcoming uh, White House cybersecurity strategy will likely project a stronger federal role to safeguard digital infrastructure and will compel industry to do more to prevent U.S. adversaries from hacking critical networks. Uh, let's see. And starting on July 1st, Virginia state agencies are required to report certain cybersecurity incidents to the Virginia Fusion Intelligence Center within 24 hours. The uh, Intelligence Center was created by a partnership between Virginia State Police and the Department of Emergency Management. FCC Chair Jessica Rosenworcel is, circula is circulating a notice of inquiry that proposes that broadband speed definition be increased from the current 25, uh, three, uh, 25 megabits per second, three megabits per second, uh, uh, increase it to 100 megabits per second and 20 megabits per second, upload download speeds. Uh, and the longer term national goal proposal is one gigabit per second, 500 megabits per second, uh, downstream, upstream. Uh, the FCC's robocall response team issued an alert to consumers regarding a rising threat of robotexts. FCC is updating robotext rules to require mobile phone companies to block likely robotext, known robotext. The FCC uh, rules currently prohibit auto-dialed text messages unless you previously gave consent to the recipient. The FCC is partnering with state attorneys generals to combat robocalls and robotext. And as I alluded earlier, the Federal Trade Commission voted 3-2 on party lines to initiate a rulemaking to expand online privacy protections by targeting online surveillance and lax data security practices by technology companies. That is the August report, which brings us to, unfortunately, we don't have June minutes yet, but we do have the May minutes. And there was an issue with the uh, um, transposition of that. Angela has kindly helped prepare them. So if you have, did anybody have any corrections or edits on those? I don't see them. Uh, they were circulated? Attached sure. to the meeting. But. I got three attachments for minutes. They were, uh, I think they were about, yeah, they were about six, six attachments, and then I sent around a couple of reports. So we, we had a lot of attachments this year for this meeting. We've been off for a while. Can I see it? Okay. No, it's a, well, my thoughts. All right. All right. Do I have a motion? There being no comment, do I have a motion to adopt the May minutes? Huh? Yes. Second. Okay. We have a second. All, right. All in favor of adopting the May minutes. Say aye. Aye. Uh, and I guess we can't have Jackie's vote here. And I'll say aye. So I, any abstentions or nays? Okay. It looks like we've adopted the May minutes there, Angela. Thank you. And we'll uh, circulate, I guess, the June minutes as soon as they're ready. Um, Richard, DTS update. I guess you maybe can give us a little. Uh, been some changes in person. <laughs> yeah, I, well, you've covered the big one. Yes. Uh, we do have an institute information officer. He comes to us from the Naval Equipment Service, a uh, long time. And by the lot of government experience, one joined us. I'm sorry, but I can't hear you. Sorry. Um, so Noren joined us a few months back and was uh, named as the CIO officially um, August 15th was his first day in the chair. 
Right, and recirculated that. In no, I circulated yes. that notice. Um, we will be recruiting for a deputy chief information officer. That may have gone live. Uh, it will go live soon. It happened. Um, and so those are the big staffing changes. I understand that you're also looking for a chief technology officer. Uh, that is That's likely the deputy. Deputy. Oh, yes. oh okay. It so gets, well, it gets an, you know, an optional okay. title. Oh, okay. okay. All right. Um, so you'll see that live on the job site. Yes, I think soon. that is that. I think the CTO position is out. So. Yes. Okay. So, that is intended to be our job. Okay. Um, so so that recruitment will begin or has begun. Um, otherwise, same folks doing the same things. So if, as you ask questions, I filter them to the right. experts and I get answers. Right. We appreciate you continuing to be our liaison. Happy to do so. All right. Um, any questions for Richard? Right, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. I so move. Second. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 I think we are adjourned. See you in September, September 28th. Thank you, everybody. We'll try to keep you apprised of the hey, developments. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for participating. And Thank you to all those who came in person to give us a physical forum so we can have a virtual Super policy. Yes. Oh, yes. Been a long time. I know, yes, two and a half years. So.